You know, um, 21 years ago, I was pregnant and I was expecting twins. And um, I had educated myself. I had bought all the pregnancy Bibles and what to expect when you're expecting. And I had researched which hospital I wanted to have my babies in. I had gone to antenatal classes. I had done everything that one was supposed to do in a basic pregnancy. And I felt I was in a good place. But I remember that in between my engagement ceremony and my wedding ceremony, I remember that my clothes, my wrapper that had been woven for me, and I was quite big because I was expecting twins, I suddenly couldn't get it to fit. That should have actually been my first trigger, to go to the hospital to see why my circumference had increased by 10 centimeters in about two or three days. But I didn't know enough to do that. And um, on the eve of my wedding, I started to bleed, and quite badly too. And then the amniotic sac started coming out by itself. So I was rushed to the labor room, and I saw my country's health system in Technicolor. I remember turning my back and thinking the epidural was going to arrive any time now. And the nurses said, no, 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 just push. And I began to negotiate. I said, I can't just push because I'm only 28 weeks. In fact, I was 28 weeks and three days. I said, I can't just push. These are premature, you know, twins. And I've read, I've learned that in this type of situation, it's better not to push. It's better to have a cesarean. And they said, look, you better just hurry up and start pushing because there's no anesthetist here. And so I started to push, and the first baby came out very tiny, but cried, and they carried her off upside down. And then the second one became stuck. And then they um, found an anesthetist, but there was a delay of about 30 minutes. And what I remember is that as they were putting the oxygen mask on my face to knock me out, I was praying. You know, and I was saying, the Lord is my shepherd. I shall not want. The Lord is my shepherd. I shall not want. And then by the time I woke up, you know, all of a sudden people weren't looking me in the eye. And now today I know that what killed that child was asphyxia, newborn asphyxia, because we don't have much time between when a baby is born and when the child takes the first breath to clear the airways. And um, if I had known then what I know now, perhaps that child would still be alive. But I had battles to face <laughs> to keep my surviving twin baby alive. So I didn't have time for recriminations. And I think that's something that's very common to us African women. We don't really have time to look back and ponder. We don't really have time to even feel sorry for ourselves. You know, in that type of a situation, every day is a struggle for survival. Even well-being, as I call it, a satisfactory state of health and education and achievement of potential, that is still a luxury. So. The word well-being in my language, alafia, it's something we use as a greeting. You know, you say, shalafiani, and people say, dada, which is good. But I don't want it to be a greeting. I want it to be reality. And I, I made certain pledges to God that if he allowed my child to live, I would do what I could to help other people because I thought, if this can happen to me, who has everything? What about the people who don't? For me and for the Wellbeing Foundation, success in keeping mothers and children alive and their being nurtured to fulfill their potential really will lie in putting the power for health-seeking behavior in the hands of women.